Welcome to the Time Bubble Podcast, the only podcast where my guests get to travel in time. I am your host, Jason Ayres, and I'm delighted to be joined today by my very good friend, Dick Dellingpole. Welcome. Hi, Jason. Yes, great to have you aboard. Uh, Now, uh, Dick is a man of many talents, one of which is he is an artist, and I expect we will talk about that a little. I also noticed, Dick, from your Twitter profile that you describe yourself as an occasional historic French soldier from the years 1815, 1917 and 1940. So could it be that I've actually stumbled across a real time traveller today? Well, uh, obviously, it's, uh, it, you know, you do reenactment. And I fell into that 20 years ago when I moved from London to Worcester and I attended the, the Battle of Worcester, the famous final battle of the of the Civil War. And uh, I just thought this looks amazing fun. It's actually quite boring to watch, but it looks like amazing fun. So I joined there and then. And that day essentially became a bona fide uh, uh, time traveller. So, yeah, yeah, this is quite my thing. Yeah, I, I've seen because I, we had a drink in a pub a couple of months back when you were actually meeting with some of the other reenactors and uh, saw you in uh, full uniform. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I kind of worked my way through a lot of different periods, um, as a lot of reenactors do. So some people just find their niche immediately and stick with it, but there, there are others who. Mr. Ben like have to try a little bit of everything. And I've worked my way through being both British Napoleonic and French Napoleonic. I really liked being French. Um, and then I I stuck with the French thing and also did World War One and Two. So uh that kind of became my thing. The moustache appeared during this period and I, and I've kept it ever since. Yes, and you are probably quite famous for that moustache now. Well, if I took it off, I, I'd lose a large part of my identity. So I'm I'm loath to do it, but uh, it, it it does trouble me slightly that that my my identity is so tied up with a piece of hair on my lip. Uh, we we all love the moustache, so <laughs> that's all good. Okay, well, what we're going to do today is we're going to give Dick the opportunity to talk about some past days of his life that he would like to revisit and a couple of other places that he might like to visit in time. So the first question I'm going to ask you uh, is if you could go back within your own life to a particular day or place or time, where would you go and what would you do? Well, of course, I've read book of yours rather wonderful book that this whole theory is based on and i know that we can't actually affect our own futures with this and i know you've bent the rules slightly um, perhaps with other guests but i'm going to stick with the theory that what you do in this um, day's visit to your past does not affect any future that you might have had so okay. with that in mind uh, yeah. i'm going back to my school days uh, i i was at um the minor public school that is Malvern College, which has uh, a fair few famous old boys. We had uh, Bernard Wetherill, the Speaker of the House of Commons at the time. He was very good. Uh, C.S. Lewis was there briefly, but hated it. Uh, famous occultist Alistair Crowley was also there. So we had um, you know, both sides of the, uh, the good and evil. Yes. Um, but while I was there in the early 80s, there was a, this non-entity whose name was Witty. Now, <laughs> no one thought much of him. He was just witty. He did science. He was quiet, largely ignored. But uh, as your guests have probably, uh, listeners rather, have probably worked out, he became Sir Professor Dr. Chris Witty, whatever he's called now. Uh, he's currently maintaining quite a low profile, but... Uh, I barely exchanged two words with him while at Malvern. And, uh, you know, looking back, there was a missed opportunity to uh, maybe give him a wedgie. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, as as we said, there, there's no consequences for anything that you do here. So consider it in an alternate timeline where it didn't really happen. So well, I, yeah. I wouldn't have wanted to wake up the next day with the consequences of possibly being rusticated, which was when you got sent home in disgrace or, or even being labeled a bully, because I certainly wasn't that. But 
uh, this guy caused us so much grief later in his life that I think yes. to pass up the opportunity of, of, of uh, at least acknowledging the fact that future him would be uh, an almighty pain to all of us. And, uh, OK, going back and giving him a wedgie is a little bit like going back and giving Hitler a Chinese burn. But uh, let's let's go with the wedgie, which um, I, hopefully not too many of your <laughs> listeners will need explaining what it is. It's when you grab the back of uh, someone's underpants and yank it really hard up their back so that they are effectively um, split in two. Okay. <laughs> yes, I don't recall um, having it done to me, but perhaps I've just blotted out the memory because I think most of us probably did at one time or another. But It was uh, a pretty standard thing right, yes. right across the... Uh, the I'm, I'm sure it's international and not just a British thing, but uh, I, I'm prepared to be educated either way. So, so Mr Whitty, quite a, a non-entity at school, and i probably fair to say that until about two and a half years ago none of us had ever heard of him and then he suddenly shot to fame so bearing in mind that we you know we're going back sort of what 35 to 40 years perhaps uh when you're going to um give him his wedgie uh, uh what will you say to him will it be uh that's for locking us down in 35 years time will he will he will he understand what you're I, talking I, I, about or maybe I don't think explain. I, I don't think he needs to understand I think <laughs> I, I think I would go up to him and say witty we barely know each other and you're going to find this very strange but trust me when I tell you that you you will deserve this <laughs> and uh, then I will administer the wedgie and just uh, walk off and leave him to it uh, he'll be bewildered but uh, I think a few years later he'll get the message Yes, I'm just thinking back to my own school days, and I can think of a lot of people that I would love to go back and give a wedgie to. Unfortunately, well, or maybe fortunately, none of them are famous, and fortunately, I'm not in touch with any of them, so so that's quite good. Though No, uh, I, I'm in touch with very few of my uh, former Malvern College Day friends. In fact, during lockdown, I pretty much lost all the friends that I had at the time and uh, made a whole load of new ones, uh, you being one of them. So, uh, you know, it's funny how things go. Nearly all my friends are about two years fresh. Yes, we certainly were facing a lot of adversity a couple of years ago, and as you rightly say, some good has come of it. And uh, we, we've made some good friends and had uh, many a, a jar in the pub of a Wednesday evening putting the world to rights. Well, we know what the resistance will be looking like now, and uh, it, it's looking good. We'll uh, we'll either win or we'll go down together fighting. Yes, and uh, of course, um, all your experience uh, of acting out as a French soldier may come in handy. Well, the musket <laughs> might come in use, but uh, let's hope not. Indeed. OK, so there's your first day. Um, same question again, really. If you could pick a, a second day that you'd like to go to and tell us about that. Well, it's really, again, because I, I won't be able to change anything that happens during that day. But just to sightsee my own life, uh, I'm going to go back to my previous um, school, another boarding school, a prep school called Hillstone, also in Malvern. And we, we did a I was in the school choir and we were quite good. And we did a trip to Berlin. Now, this was 1979. So, you know, the wall was still yes. very much a thing and would be for another 10 years. Um and we had a coach trip, which took us through Checkpoint Charlie. Uh, we were obviously guided by a member of the security police, and it was all very strictly nailed down. You always supervised. But I'd just love to relive that day. It didn't mean an awful lot to me back, day, back then. But the idea of going through what is now effectively a tourist attraction, i.e. Checkpoint Charlie, we had a... Uh, we had American machine guns trained on us as we went through one bit. And then once we we're through the no man's land in between the two walls, we had um, East German slash Russian uh, machine guns trained on us. And it was a very rare thing to be passing through as a tourist. So we were kind of given dispensation to do this. And the guide was constantly telling us, and, and the building on the left, which is currently being reconstructed after the war, uh, we heard that expression maybe 15 to 20 times on, on this trip. Um, everything was so grey and bleak. And I think if anything 
gave me a taste of communism. It was that. Uh, and they probably thought they were bigging up the place. But really, to, to those of us from the decadent West, we were thinking, you know what? We're, we kind of like our decadent West. So uh, I'd love to do that trip again. Uh, and and I, I take in so much more this time around. I mean, it, it's that whole thing of uh, these experiences are often wasted on the young. Yes. Well, the good thing about going in 1979 um, is that it was before that awful song by Alton John, so you wouldn't have to think of that playing while you went through the checkpoint. <laughs> no, but think about how all the music that would have been brewing back then. Yes. God, that would have been another thing. We, we could have a whole other podcast based on going back to see gigs that you wished you'd gone to in the various years. I mean, well, 1979 uh, I think... was probably one of the best years because it, it was the, the height of the punk and, and, and rebellion wasn't it that was the well you punk had the, was the maturing and the clash point, and, yeah and all, it all was that starting sort of stuff to become something else um but going back to the the east germany thing I, I i never went behind the iron curtain in that period but i've always been quite fascinated by it and it was very interesting what you said because i remember we used to get footage on on television of what east germany and 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 russia looked like and like you you said there that it was unremittingly grim and i i wondered how much of it was accurate really and how much was perhaps propaganda because you had all this stuff about you know 300 people queuing for one loaf of bread and uh, and those sort of things and uh, uh, was it really uh that grim i mean it sounds like it was from what you described well it, it was a, a, a murky overcast day quite fittingly i'm sure if it was bright sunshine i'd have seen it differently but i'm thinking yeah. there was no color uh, and there was hardly anyone around and we went to places like the the war memorial and things like that where you're supposed to be able to see the guards goose stepping which was a huge attraction but i think the weather was so bad they weren't doing it that day maybe that was why there was no one in but thinking in terms of what brings color to our streets is generally neon signs advertising hoardings um the, the signs above shops yeah and all of this was lacking because there were there were no advertising hoardings so what there was no neon it, it was it, it was almost like a stage set for uh for a world war ii movie very little had changed since the war uh thus the the the, the guide telling us how everything was still being reconstructed so uh yeah it, it really was as grim and gray as i remember i'm pretty sure yeah because just trying to picture it in my head I, i'm seeing it in the style of a 1960s black and white movie it's very hard to imagine any any color yeah so. well well it, it you know the, the gray stone and concrete and uh, of the uh, of the buildings so uh, and it was that awful sort of rebuilt in the in the soviet style so yeah. everything was pretty much uh um that grim architecture that they went for back then and uh yeah i, I, w I was glad to be out of it but yeah, yeah say fascinating experience uh, that was wasted on the on the very young me yes so it would be interesting to go back now with all your years of experience oh, well, I've, I've, I've been back and now you, with my wife and it, but to go back to 1979 version oh to say, yeah, yeah 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 i mean yeah. Uh, my, my recent trip to berlin you, you can barely tell which side of the wall of the X wall you are on now. I mean, the, yeah. the, all, all the places that were East Berlin are now quite shishi and, uh, and hip, but uh, yeah, th th there's very little trace of that wall left. And um, I, I think it's almost a crying shame, but uh, uh, it, it's a, certainly a city that's still dining out on its past in that respect. Yeah. That's f fascinating stuff. Oh, okay. Moving on then. What's your third day that you'd like to go back to? Well, um, a year or so ago, my good friend Jonathan Miles Lee died. And he, he your listeners may have heard the podcast he did with my brother, which I was yes, also present at. Um, he was an absolutely fascinating chap. And I just wished I'd had a chance to reestablish contact with him. So I'm going to twist your rules slightly. and take him up on the offer of uh, that, that he made at one point that I should pop down to London and visit him because at this time he was hanging out with Francis Bacon and uh, 
uh, at, at Soho House and various other haunts in um, the sleazier parts of London. He was living a very bohemian life with a really interesting crowd. And I, I didn't take up the offer to go and see him. And sadly, when he died, I'd only just reestablished contact with him. And uh, I, I just wish I'd done that earlier. So the lesson here is uh, stay in touch with your interesting old friends because uh, they, they might not always be around for you. Now, he he was a better painter than any other of my friends that I, I, I could think of. And he didn't even do art at art college. He, he did history of art or something like that. And um, he was so talented in everything he turned his hand to. And on top of all that, he had this bizarre psychic ability um so you're never going to be bored in his company he was endlessly fascinating and a beautiful person so yeah my my, my day would be spent with jonathan yeah i mean there's a couple of things uh, that i'll pick up on there uh certainly that whole bohemian soho scene is one that quite fascinates me because you mentioned francis bacon but i've read a couple of books by other people who were part of that scene um one of whom was tom baker uh uh of doctor who fame who Mm -hmm. was around that uh that scene and also i don't know if you heard of jeffrey bernard the yeah yeah the famous the the, the legendary racing journalist and they were all part of that crowd and uh it it sounds it was all incredibly uh decadent and uh, i don't know if, if you've seen the um the Jeffrey Bernard play that Peter O'Toole was in. It's Jeffrey called... Bernard is unwell. Yes. It's, yeah. uh... no, I, I haven't actually seen it, but, no, but I, I think um... that whole scene was quite, quite decadent and loose and all those other things. Um, I, I'm not sure I'd like to have lived it, but no. you know, just to dip in and, uh, and experience it briefly is uh, because uh, Francis Bacon was urging Jason not to let himself get drawn into that scene. He was saying, look, God, you must get the hell out of London. Otherwise, you'll end up like us. Now, yeah. that seems a fairly strange thing for a world famous artist to say. But uh, he was quite right that uh, it, it's. It's like a, a siren's call that, that draws you in and you'll never get out once you get into the, the the constant drip feed of alcohol and drugs and sex. It would uh, um, be very difficult to break out of it. I think it would be nice to go for a weekend, but you'd probably need a couple of weeks off to recover. Yeah, and, and the rest of it. Yeah. But, um, I listened uh, to the podcast that uh, your brother James did with Jonathan, uh, probably not long before he died uh, he, I, I know he was it wasn't quite long, Ill at no. the time um and there was some really fascinating stuff there you said about his mind and the way he fought and uh when he was talking all about the uh you know the pineal gland and how that works to do with drinking water and and there was, there was just so much there that was that was interesting I'd, I'd certainly recommend people went and have a listen to that because it's so but he's also owner. He's also helped me on my my journey into discovering that I am, after all, a Christian, because you know, he, he he discovered it fairly late in life. And with, with for the same reasons that, you know, that there's evil afoot out there uh, and that there is an obvious way of combating that. I don't want to start droning on about Christianity, but he definitely helped me with that part of my journey. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I thank him for that, too. Definitely. Well, um, a sad loss, and uh, I wish you'd got to spend more time with him when you had really the chance. Do, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we're going to move on to the second part of the podcast now, and I've got a, a couple of extra questions that I normally ask people. Uh, this gives you a bit more scope now. You're going to step outside of your own life. So the the next question is, if you could go anywhere in time and step into anybody else's shoes be they famous or not who would you like to be for a day well this one i was thinking that as a reenactor we're always trying to get it right and trying to recreate what we would have looked like how we would have felt smelt uh everything the whole sensory thing now i i i've thought the Battle of Waterloo several times as a reenactor on the original battlefield. But I'd love to have actually been there, obviously, as a survivor. Uh, so I, I've chosen someone who played a very 
important role in that battle and definitely survived to a, a ripe old age of, I think, 77. And this is Sergeant Charles Ewart uh, of the Scots Greys, so a cavalryman. Uh, he was uh, abnormally tall for that time. He was over six foot, um, a stocky guy, um, a, a, a master swordsman. And at the time of Waterloo, a sergeant. So, you know, in a, in a, a, a quite an important role within his unit. And he famously captured one of the French eagles during the action at Waterloo. Now, the French did not give up their eagles lightly. You know, it's having your colours stolen. It, it's a massive shame on your regiment. And he took the eagle of the Carol Sankiem uh, regiment of foot. Um in a cavalry charge into that that regiment now it wasn't just a matter of lucking out he was in the thick of it and he was fighting i mean i just want to read this brief quote from him yes please he he, he he after waterloo he 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 got promoted to uh an ensign so he got made up as an officer so he could retire on on full pay on that uh no no less than he deserved for doing this and he describes the action in one part as this one made a thrust at my groin. I parried him off and cut him down through the head. A lancer came at me. I threw the lance off to my right side and cut him through the chin and upwards through the teeth. Next, a foot soldier fired at me and then charged me with his bayonet, which I also had the good luck to parry, and then I cut him down through the head. So you can picture this guy. He's just lopping people's heads not off but you know slicing them through the head and through the teeth and up through the jaw uh with, with his cavalry saber um uh, with his full weight behind him doing that while he hacks his way to grab this this banner which w would have just meant so much to to the british troops as he took it back through them so uh you know he he lived to see the day but i think more importantly for me he would have got to see firsthand the Battle of Waterloo. And it's reported that as he left the field, he turned round briefly and observed what was going on before he left with the with the captured eagle, because he was sent to the back to make sure that the French didn't take this uh, precious uh, thing back. So he would have turned and watched what was going on. And that's what I would have wanted. I would I would have wanted to see that miraculous French column, which was uh, imagine the French column coming down the slight incline. It's 200 men wide and 24 ranks deep. And that is marching wow. down this slope towards the British troops. Uh, that That's a heck of a lot of men on one field in one action. Uh, and somehow we overcame that, uh, no, the, 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 yes. the, the allies. And he came out completely unscathed? Um, he was unscathed, yes. And uh, he, his reputation, um, I, I doubt he bought himself a drink for the rest of his life. And uh, he, he was eventually interred in... Um, at Edinburgh Castle, having previously been been buried elsewhere, but you know, obviously, I, I'm not going to try and claim as an Englishman. He he was a Scotsman, but uh, clearly one of the best. Yes, so now that would be quite interesting. So presumably, so people interpret this in lots of different ways. So I think if you were going to be him for a day, you you would need to possess obviously all of his his battle skills and experience. But even so, um, would you not find if you were him and you were going in to do all those things, uh, uh, a modicum of fear, perhaps? <laughs> that, uh, um, uh, he was an experienced soldier at that point. He, yeah. he, he'd, he'd seen a fair bit of action. Um, but uh, I think one of the things you learn through reenactment is we are not like the people back then. They right. they had a, a much tougher life and um, that they, they were happier, happy with a lot less than what we have in the way of comfort. So his trade would have been fighting and killing. And, yes. uh, and, and I think soldiers to some extent, they live for those moments because Let's face it, the Battle of Waterloo, it would be the most momentous thing those soldiers ever took part in. But the whole thing took a day. You know, it didn't start yeah. till midday and it was over by about 7 p.m. Um, 
there's an awful lot of marching and sitting around and not doing an awful lot in a soldier's yeah. life, in any soldier's life, to actually look forward to, to the actual fighting. And to a lot of those men, it was their last chance at promotion because you're not going to get promoted unless there's someone above you who's being killed. So it, it, it was an opportunity, certainly for the officers to to make something of themselves, To that it, it, everyone was aware that this was possibly the last battle of a generation. Because it was the battle that ended the Napoleonic Wars. It was yeah. all over after that. So yeah. I, I think a lot of them would have had a feeling that this was a last chance. And uh, I think the Worcester Regiment, the 29th, uh, I, myself being a Worcester person, they arrived the day after. <laughs> they must have been gutted. I mean, they were sent yeah. as reinforcements, but it was all over. And uh, that the men were probably going, well dodge that one but the officers would have been tearing their hair out thinking there goes my last chance at a promotion it is interesting what you say about how perhaps people have changed since then and i think it's an ongoing process in that we do have incredibly pampered lives now and uncomfortable lives and i know it's this is a sort of cliche that you you get retired colonels writing to the daily mail about the youth of today and uh, how soft everybody is but i think there is an element of truth and i mean if you look back to 200 years or even 100 years ago um it's hard to imagine the generations today so willingly fighting uh, going off to fight uh well the, even the army would admit that it's having to soften up it's having to lower its standards of entry it's uh um they, they they have to pamper the recruits a little bit more than they used to. I mean, yeah. OK, the, the, there's been some terrible examples of abuse of young troops, like at Deep Cut, there were uh, there were some dodgy goings on. But by and large, uh, the pampered kids do need a certain amount of brutalizing before they become useful soldiers. And um, it, it's. It should be that one of the toughest lives of all being a soldier. And uh, that's one thing we'll never quite get as reenactors. We we will never be brutalized before we put on those uniforms and pretend to take part in those battles. But uh, the, the the more you read, I, I like to read actual soldiers experiences, you know, the diaries of various yeah. Napoleonic soldiers and what have you. And um the things that really made a difference to them would be things like a pair of boots that fit. You know, they they, they might stumble across a, a dead uh, a dead colleague, and they'll be like, "But luck would have it, he had the same size feet as me, and I got from him a stout pair of walking boots." And you know, it's that sort of thing that you realise, "Wow, well, we have it way too easy." Well, yeah. Whereas today's teenagers will kick up a fuss if they don't get the latest hundred pound pair of trainers. Quite. And, uh, you know, the, it, it's, society has gone soft. We know these things come in cycles. You know, that whole thing about uh, good times lead to soft people and soft people lead yeah. to bad times and bad times lead to um, fighting. And uh, we toughen up again. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's an endless cycle. And at the moment we're at we're at peak softness. We're, we're ripe for yeah, either think... revolution or war or uh, famine, whatever's coming. And I think a lot of us feel that there is something big just around the corner. Yes. And it's and I not think going to be nice. Perhaps um, we're going to have to start toughening up pretty quickly. So I don't think we've got any choice. I think it will yeah. be, uh, yeah, t toughen yeah. up or, or go under. Yes. Okay. One final question before we go. If you could go anywhere in time, and this could be past, present or future, my first guest surprised me by saying she wanted to go into the future, which I hadn't expected, but where would you go? Um, because I've already covered off the Napoleonic period, which which might have been a good choice otherwise, I was thinking where would have be the most interesting and different period to actually visit and i was thinking vikings i was thinking middle ages and I, I plumped for ancient rome because i think what we're experiencing now is the final days of rome for western civilization and oh, i quite agree I, i'd like to see rome at its peak and uh I, i'd walk around rome as an observer 
I don't think my uh, my uh, public school Latin would have quite given me enough skill to actually hold out a conversation. So I'd be silently walking around, observing Rome for a day and just seeing what they were wearing, what they were eating, how they behaved to each other, just drinking it all in with my eyes. I, I would absolutely love an opportunity to do that and just see how advanced they were before this massive fall. How decadent were they? How how ripe for the barbarians at the gates? It's um, you know, I think the parallels are quite uh, are quite telling. Uh, you know, a society that gets so rich and fat and 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 decadent that it it's just ready to fall. Yeah, well, the the classic cliche of the decadence is the image of the the sort of fat uh, senator or whoever's lying on a slab with the bunch of grapes and the the various uh, uh, women around him, slave and, girls uh, peeling yeah. grapes and popping them in his mouth. Yeah, I mean, if you've got to that stage, then you're not really going to be doing much in the way of conquering or expanding the empire. But maybe that's just an image that we've sort of been fed by movies but i'm quite yeah I, i'm fascinated about the way that rome itself fell uh and you can see this you know like in england or britain or whatever it was that you know they built the the, the various roman villas and, and they were sophisticated dwellings we've all been to the roman villas and if you look at the the level of technology advance they had if they had continued on, I mean, you look where 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 we are now. It's only the last sort of couple hundred years we've had the Industrial Revolution. They, the level of advance they had in, say, 100, 200 AD, if, if they hadn't fallen and gone on, you could imagine that they would be oh, they, they would have incredibly had industrial space revolution. age by now, wouldn't they? Absolutely. They, they, they were probably on the cusp of some form of uh, of technological advancement that, that would have... Um... Yeah, it w would have made Europe look very different the way, the way it is today. But uh, is there a, a natural point at which a, a civilization will self-destruct? Yeah. And it's not always a given that you go on developing and things no. don't always get better, which is a tragedy when you're born, when we were born to, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, you think that uh, th that we're living through a a constant improvement um state but it's not the case so many things are worse now than they were back then um, but it you know, did our, seem... our diets for a start yeah you know it's uh we're getting worse in so many ways so was rome destined to self-destruct because it came from within really didn't it rather than just without yeah and when you look at rome Really, the, the the sort of whole Roman Empire, we, we're talking hundreds of years, and the advances would have been at a relatively slower pace than, than what we're used to. And I mean, even when Rome fell, it took a couple of hundred years, really. It, it, it didn't happen overnight, I would say. No, I mean, and, and of course, thing. the empire was so vast that yeah. it was almost like a sort of a, a, an amoeba that has split up several times. And those other amoebas go on to have very different lives elsewhere um but the the central source amoeba yeah. fell but even then its influence is going on uh, you know forever more so it, it's not it's not as if every single roman was wiped out that they, no. they would have been absorbed into the society that took over from them just just like they were absorbed into britain really i i would think the speed of advance of our society that has been so much faster i mean we you know even in our own lifetimes that if we were to fall i think we would fall a lot faster um yes i, th I think that's true we developed faster we will fall faster and we've yeah. got further to fall of course i mean we have this th this society doesn't genuinely know what hunger and starvation is like no. i mean the, the politicians are always going on about people living in poverty and, and literally starving i think that that, that that that's somewhat far from the truth i'm no doubt there'll be people telling me that uh, i'm completely wrong on this wow. but uh sometimes poverty is judged on whether or not you have uh, a decent wi-fi connection or how many yeah. tvs you've got in your house and um you know it's it's all very relative 
Well, let's see but, where uh, things are going because uh, with everything that's happening in the world, um, we may discover what that's like sooner than we would hope. So I, I'd rather we'll think we happens. will. And uh, yeah, I'm not relishing the idea, but uh, you know, prepare for the worst. Yes, and hope for the best. Okay. Thank you. That's for a really your... uplifting way to well, finish. That we're well, all going to die. Yes. Well, at least we can try and enjoy it while we can. I would say, people, make the most of uh, summer, and uh, who knows what's coming down the pipe. Yeah, I think I think winter's going to be pretty grim, but yeah. uh, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Well, thank you for coming along. Before you go. Is there anything you'd like to uh, promote your your website or or any other activities you're involved in? Well, I've got three things on the go at least. Okay. Uh, the the one is my the art side of things. Now I do these military illustrations that have ter- I've turned them into cigarette cards, which have proved quite popular. You can see those at dellingpolestudio.co.uk. Um, Dellingpole with one L. Um, the other thing I have my libertarian drinking club third <laughs> Wednesday, which, which I know all about proved massively popular, <laughs> much to my delight. Um, you can find out where a venue is. Uh, if you want to go out for a midweek drink on the third Wednesday of the month, you can go to libertariandrinks.com, where you will find a map with, which will hopefully have a dot on it that's near you. Uh, And the final one is my Christian version of that, which is called Thursday Circle, where we essentially have a drink and talk about God, which is way more interesting than it actually sounds. And you will find that at ThursdayCircle.com. So uh, if I could get you to put those on the the links, Jason, that would be very helpful. I certainly will. Yeah, I certainly recommend going along to one of those, particularly the third Wednesdays when you will meet some of the most interesting people you could possibly find. Quite right. Okay. Well, that's about it for this week. Um, thank you very much for joining me. No, thank you for having me. And um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Cheers then, Jason. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye. Bye.